So welcome everybody. Today is our service of lessons and carols. Uh, lots of people taking part, doing readings, uh, lots of traditional carols and it's great to have you with us and if you're also watching us on uh, YouTube uh, later on, that's good too. Our first carol that we're going to sing is Once in Royal David's City. Once in Royal David's City. <laughs> Please join me as we pray. And we're going to pray. Father God, this morning we thank you that we can be here to share in our service of lessons and carols. Father God, we thank you for all those who wrote the carols, those who many years ago uh, you gave them inspiration to write down things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, to pick up on words of scripture and use them to encourage and help us as we remember his birth. And this morning, help us to sing with joy and thanksgiving. Lord, give us joyful and happy hearts as we share together. But we thank you, Lord, for those that you inspired to write the scriptures. Lord, the uh, message of the birth of Christ. We thank you that this morning we shall see the, uh, some of the uh, prophecies which tell and speak of the, the coming birth of a child, the one who would be the Messiah. 
We thank you that we shall also read the actual accounts of his birth and what happened immediately after. And Lord, we thank you that we will have an opportunity to think, what does this mean to me? Lord, hear our singing. Enjoy our singing, Lord, as we do it for you. Hear the readers, Lord. Bless those who are going to share with us. For those, Lord, in the congregation or watching on a video, Lord, we pray that the words of Scripture which are written on pages will come out of those and into people's lives, that we might know that the Bible is the inspired, the living Word of God to us. Lord, we would pray that as we give you our thanks and as we give you our praise, Lord, that you will hear us, that you will answer our prayers, that you will help us as we share together afterwards. And Lord, we pray that this might be a great time of worship, praise, adoration, and listening to your voice. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Relationship Broken, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 19. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her, your, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. For the woman, to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about, about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Oh, sorry. Um, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since it, from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
A reading from Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You enlarge the nation and increase their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. At worries rejoice when set dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rod at their oppressor. Every warrior boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establish and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The seal of the Lord Almighty will accompany this. Amen. As it's the second Sunday in Advent, we are going to light the Advent candles. Um, so, our oh, candles, yep, two candles today. So, who would like to light these two, Joe? That was quick, wasn't it? Which one's the one there? These two, the yeah. Second Sunday of Advent. 15 sleeps. Sorry? 15 sleeps. 15 sleeps to Christmas. Thank you. Jo's got it right now. She used to count down to Christmas Eve. She used to get it wrong. So this is the second Sunday in Advent. I just want to take for a, a moment today, some oh, oh, a bit longer than a moment maybe, something from that reading that we just heard. Because we heard there a birth announcement to us, a child is born, to us a son is given. How wonderful it is for people when they welcome a child into the family. And they usually you know, tell people in different ways. At one time it used, to, it used to go in their local paper, but it doesn't so often now I don't think. But I was looking at um, uh, birth announcements and suggestions to how you could announce a birth. Here were some suggestions. It's a boy. Our little star has brought overwhelming delight into the house. And you are all welcome to indulge in our happiness. Keep us in your prayers. That was a good one. He may be small, but he's already the ruler of our hearts. Please welcome our little king who has us all wrapped up around his tiny fingers. Or... Our hearts are bursting with love for our little man. Then the name. He's the spitting image of his dad and has already brought so much joy into our lives. Well, it's an exciting time. And usually the name is given, the birth weight, and sometimes the length of the baby. <laughs> now, I don't know if that was an American... Um, sorry if any Americans are watching... Uh, website that I looked on but the length of the baby I thought how do you measure the length of a baby when you've got to kind of squash them down haven't you? and stretch them out to measure the length but there's a huge difference between that birth announcement in Isaiah and these because Isaiah wrote it around 700 years before he was born and yet he writes as if it's happened it's happening unto us, a child is born. Absolute certainty. But he gives not the name, the weight, or the length. Perhaps you've heard that, uh, how do they know that Jesus weighed seven pounds, three ounces? Because they had a weigh in a manger. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, rather the role that the child will fulfil. Who he is and why he has come. 
And so just briefly, I want to look at the four aspects that we heard this morning. First of all, wonderful counsellor. Now, is it one or is it two? Is it wonderful counsellor, as John read, or is it wonderful counsellor? Well, the answer is yes, it is. It doesn't matter how we look at it. He is a counsellor, one who comes alongside us and stands at our shoulder. Just think about what qualifications would be needed for a counsellor. Does Jesus fit them? Well, first of all, he would have to be trustworthy to hold confidences. You know, you wouldn't want to see somebody, would you, who is going to share everything that you've said? Not at all. Jesus is fully trustworthy. We can put our whole trust in him. He would need to, the, the counsellor would need to have knowledge about you as a person. That has to be built up over time. You know, when you go to see a doctor, I'm sure that you will prefer a doctor I've seen sometimes, and you walk in and it's obvious they've looked at the notes and they say something about you to you that you think this person's read up about me a little bit. I don't like it when I go in and they say, right, what's your name? And then they go on the screen and it's obviously there they're reading. You want somebody who knows about you. Built up over time. Jesus knows us. Jesus knows what is going on in our lives. You know, there are different situations in the Gospels where Jesus knew all about people without them telling him. He spoke to a woman at the well and he said, you've had five husbands. How could he have known that? Others, he knew what they were thinking. They, they also need to be fully capable. If we go anywhere to get any medical help, we want to be sure, don't we, that they are qualified. You know, doctors, if you look on the websites of doctors' practices and things, you'll see the doctors' names, you'll see where they were trained, you will see when they were qualified. Jesus is fully capable of meeting our needs. He is mighty God that we're going to look at in a moment. And we've got to let him be that wonderful counsellor to us. You know, if you went to see the doctor, there'd be no, no point, would there? Saying, well, why have you come to see me? And so you tell them exactly why you've come, then you get up and walk out the door. They'd say, uh, just a moment, I need to tell you what you've got to do. Or I need to tell you what I think is the problem. You need to listen to what they say. And how they say you ought to be treated. So we've got to listen to the wonderful counsellor. The second thing is that he is mighty God. Now we could spend so much time on all these points, but I want to see them as a whole this morning. John 1, that we'll hear later, says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, the Word, that's Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, that was written by somebody who'd spent three years with him at close quarters, and had seen. So when he said, we have seen his glory, he meant it. I don't want to go through a load of proof texts, we just haven't got time, um, but we need to acknowledge who Jesus is. He is God, but he is mighty God. He was mighty God in creation. As we look at the creation, I'm always astounded at the sheer beauty, the magnitude of it. The sheer magnitude of what God created through Jesus. He was mighty in his birth. Not in the manner. That was very low-key, really, wasn't it, if you think about it. But never has one birth broken time in two, apart from his. B.C. and A.D. Only the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ did that. Now, I know that there's lots of moves. People now seem to call it BCE and CE, before the Common Era and the Common Era. 
But it hasn't changed the date. It hasn't changed where it went. And so even if you want to call it BCE and CE, the question is still, but when did it change? Well, it changed when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Changed the letters, but it still focuses on one year. He was mighty in his miracles and his teaching. If you think about his miracles that he did, we haven't got time to look at them all this morning. He was the one who could feed 5,000 from just a small um, amount. He was the one who could make lepers clean. He was the one who rose, could rise people from the dead. He was mighty in his miracles. He was mighty in his teaching. If you look at the Gospels and look at what Jesus said, that is wonderful teaching. Wonderful teaching there, mighty. He was mighty in his death. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory, the victory over death, through our Lord Jesus Christ. He was mighty in his death. He was mighty in his resurrection as he rose from the dead. He will be mighty in his return because he's going to come back. And the Bible says every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. The last World Cup football final I looked was watched by 1.5 billion people around the world. 1.5 1.5 billion people, about one in five of the whole population of the world, saw it. Something drew them. Every eye was, going, was on the television or computer or phone, wherever they were watching, of that 1.5 billion. The Bible says every eye of every person alive will see. It's going to be mighty. He is mighty God. Thirdly, he is everlasting Father. Now, maybe that's the most difficult to understand because we have Father God and we have Jesus the Son. Even though it's clear from Scripture that they are one and the same, we get this title. Why was Jesus called everlasting Father? Well, a Hebrew meaning of the word is the originator or the source. Jesus is the Father, the source of everything eternal. So that means if you want something eternal, go to Jesus. Now the eternity of Christ is mind-boggling because everything that we know has got a beginning and an end. Everything. There was a time when things were created, when they were made and when they fail. Electrical goods, you'll know they've got a time to fail. It's a week after the warranty runs out. (laughs) A pen. A pen fails. A plant will grow, but will eventually die. A rainstorm will come, but won't last forever. A person sadly dies. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. Sometimes if I go into school and, uh, and talk uh, to the children there and they get questions, a lot of them is about, when was God born? <laughs> I just have to say, I don't know. He wasn't. He's always been there. You'll never understand that, but he's always been there. And he always will be. And the inference of this is that, first of all, he's able to deal with our past. If he's got everything eternal in his hands, he can deal with our past, which he did through the cross. Everything that we've ever done wrong can be forgiven through the cross of Jesus and trusting and believing in him. He is with us in the present because he's the wonderful counsellor. He said, I am with you always. Means he's alongside us. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So that means that through the Holy Spirit, he's with us today. So he can deal with our past, he's with us in the present, and he will take us for the future. 
I am the resurrection and the life, said Jesus. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. But they will live forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. And he's everything in between. And the fourth thing, the final thing, is the Prince of Peace. If you want something eternal, I said, go to Jesus. If you want peace, go to Jesus. Why is he the prince? Why not the king? Well, in the language, the prince is the greatest or the chief. The greatest or the chief. You know, we look at birth announcements, and when you've got children, the worst thing at Christmas is if they ask for something that you can't get. That's one of those really difficult presents that, um, you know, I, I, I know we've been at times on the internet and going through website after website trying to find a, a certain thing. Christmas toys. It used to be searching the shops, going around the shops, and now it's sitting in front of a screen, sought after but elusive. And that's how peace has been described. The most sought after but the most elusive treasure. Jesus came to bring peace with God. In Romans 5.1, we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the most important thing in life is to get our lives right with God. Peace through forgiveness of our sins, our wrongdoing. But then he also came to bring peace within now, people face a constant battle of anxiety and stress and there is pressure and the families and friends and health and sadness and loneliness and financial things and more. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, if we allow him to lead us, will bring peace from those things. Now, on the outside, people can look at peace within, at peace, can't they, with themselves? Yet on the inside, it's a different story. There's kind of that turmoil and things going round and round. Take it to Jesus. And he also gives peace with each other. We've been looking re over recent weeks at Romans. In Romans 12, 18, we looked at this. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. They are in connected, interconnected with God, within, and with others. And I suggest that without the first, the others won't come. You need to be at peace with God to be at peace with each other. And then that can spread, to, to have peace within, sorry, and then that can spread out to have peace with each other. Somebody called Addison Leach said, we want the peace without the prince. Is that me? Is that you? Do we want peace in our lives? Do we want to see peace in our world? Of course we do. But do we want to see it without the prince of peace? Now, just to finish off. We have here in the Bible the most amazing Christmas gift Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The most amazing gift. But we need to open it. We've got paper that matches the boards that we've got in the church as well. What do we have inside? That gift. We've got the wonderful counsellor. We've got the mighty God. We've got the everlasting father. We've got the prince of peace. And my question is, have we got one gift or four gifts? What do you think? One gift or four gifts? The answer is, we've got one in four and four in one. He's the gift to us of the Son given 
the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, as we go through these carols and readings, we see in a moment the branch from Jesse, as we see the one laid in a manger, the one who was announced by angels who, and shepherds went to see and, and major I went to. Keep in mind, he's the wonderful counsellor. Even when he was that baby in that manger, he's all those things that we've just looked at. We've got today nine readings, nine carols, all about one person. Now we're going to listen to our next reading. Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through to 9, the branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give the decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down for the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Amen. Reading 5 is read from Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a 
in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from all their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will give, be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name of Jesus. Amen. The sixth reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room at the inn. Amen.
the shepherds hear the news. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Magi visit the Messiah, as recorded in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. 
When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Amen. reading today is um, from John and it's uh, John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14 the relationship restored in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was with God in the beginning through all through him all things were made without him nothing was made that has been made in him was life and that life was the light of men the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man 
was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, thank you to everybody who's taken part in any way. I've almost finished. But I, I just go back and, uh, to when I was a child. And I remember we used to have a big sack of presents that had come from all different people. And I was often guilty of opening one, putting it to one side, opening another, putting it to one side, opening another, putting it to one side. Then at the end, could I remember them from? Could I? You know, I'm always um, interested to see in our house on Christmas Day or when we open presents that Anne, working in a school, as you guess, she gets quite a few little gifts from children, which are really great. She always makes a list. Who gave it to her? What it was? Why did she do that? To say thank you. And she still does it every year to say thank you. What happened to Isaiah 9 verse 7? He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We put it to one side. It's easy to do, isn't it? It's so, so easy to do. Has the gift and the giver been lost in all the other things that we've done this morning? Will it be lost in everything of Christmas? Let's remember to say thank you. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for these songs that we've sung, the readings that we've listened to. But we thank you the most for your gracious presence among us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as the wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and still is, and always will be. And Father God, we pray that we might not lose sight of him in everything else that we do. Help us to remember that the greatest gift was given by you. Described in the scriptures as one that cannot be conceived. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us to know, to love, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. We've got one more song to sing. We're going to sing the first three verses of O Come, O Ye Faithful.
please take your seats. Would you join me for our final prayer? Heavenly Father, may we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our wonderful counsellor. Would he draw alongside us through every day of this week? May we know him as mighty God. May we know him as everlasting Father. And Lord, we pray that we might too be the Prince of Peace in our lives, in our town, in our church, and indeed in this world. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both this day and forevermore. Amen.